Hello, dear guests. Uh, so we will start. I apologize for the delay for about 10 minutes, but we want to respect those who came on time, so we will start. So we named our symposium as Hot Topics in Public Health, and it's being offered as part of the Fourth International Medical Congress of Armenia. So we are very thankful to the organizers of this Congress and I would like to particularly emphasize the efforts of Dr. Gevor Gyakjan who helped us to put this together and allowed us to have this opportunity. Uh, so we have been thinking what are the hot topics in public health and we came up with the following idea although I have to say that for our society right now the hot topic is for fortification if you look at our media, almost every day there is a, an article published on how bad food fortification is and how we should try to avoid that. You know, we have a few guests from different countries. I see people from the US, from the UK, and maybe, uh, you know, you can talk to your colleagues, you know, physicians, nurses, public health professionals, and share your experience because everyone is concerned, including health providers. Although we try to bring some evidence about you know, food fortification from other countries. However, today we're not go going to cover this topic because we don't have an expert with us. But our colleagues from the Institute of Nutrition at Columbia University are going to help to put together a separate symposium um, food fortification, hopefully coming fall or next spring, so that we will have opportunity for our health professionals to get together to discuss, have an opportunity to ask questions and get their answers to their burning questions. For today, we divided our program into three subsections. So we will start with communicable diseases, particularly focusing on tuberculosis because this is a, a number one, one of the public health issues in Armenia. And we'll have a smooth transition to non-communicable diseases, another big issue. And uh, many of you were at the opening ceremony uh, where the minister mentioned that around 90% of mortality are due to non-communicable diseases. And we will also discuss a few things related to environmental health, because this is another very hot topic for Armenia. You know, mining is booming in our country, and we have weak regulations, we have weak enforcement of existing regulations, and as a result, we have issues. And we have done few research projects, and we would like to share the results with all of you and to push the agenda for evidence-based policy making in our country. But before we start our presentations, I'm very pleased to say that we have a keynote speaker who is Dr. Sandra Minor Woolmer, who is the interim dean of the School of Health and Human Services from Southern Connecticut State University. She will talk about the value of the health education specialist in public health practice. So she will cover the value, the importance of these uh, programs, the public health programs in our educational programs. And later we will present uh, you know, a few projects that have been done by those who are graduates of public health programs. Okay, Dr. Palmer. I 
will say it again. Greetings from Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, Connecticut. This is a picture of our campus, and this is during a beautiful time of year when we have lovely weather and it's not snowy and icy and, and dark. Um, thank you so much for this privilege of speaking to you today and being a guest at your conference. I have just been experiencing my first visit to Armenia during this week, and I must tell you that I think I have fallen in love with your country. I know very little about your public health practice at this particular point in time. I've been meeting with a lot of people and learning a lot about your medical system, about your public health infrastructure, and about some of the health issues that the Armenian people are dealing with. And it's been a wonderful learning experience for me and for my colleagues who have joined me on this trip. I see that in your symposia today, you'll be focusing on uh, many important topics, and some of them are not so different than the public health topics that we are focusing on in the US. For those of you that have spent time in the US, it won't surprise you when I say that things are not all well in the public health system in the United States either. We suffer from tremendous health disparities and inequities in our population. In some of our areas, including the state of Connecticut, where I'm based, we have some of the highest rates of childhood poverty in communities that are adjacent to some of the highest per capita incomes in the entire country. So our disparities are really quite profound and not so different, I think, from some of what you're experiencing in your public health practice. The topics that you're addressing, um, looking at smoking, for example, among healthcare workers, are also issues that we find challenging in the United States. And in some cases, we've made some incremental progress. And there might be opportunities for us to have dialogue with you about some of the lessons that we learned as we made that journey to trying to reduce smoking rates in the population and changing the social norms around smoking. We had a 50-year journey to get to where we are, where about 20% of our population smoke instead of 55% at the end of our World War II in 1946. So we've made a lot of progress. We were at a peak with our smoking rates in 1963, and we've come down and hit a plateau where we're not making good progress anymore. So we're looking for new things that we can do to move the dial a little further. But there are other challenges we have as well. I saw on your schedule you'll be addressing childhood blood lead levels. And in our inner cities, we still have these challenges in the United States. What we find are that our health issues track along the lines of income, race, and education. And that is not so different, I think, from other nations, whether developed or developing. And we have a lot of work to do. But what we've been trying to do recently is reform some of our health care and the way we provide health care and address more intentionally issues around prevention. Strange way of dealing with payment for health care delivery. Very complicated and not very rational. But recently we have change the focus to try to provide health insurance and health coverage to a larger percentage of our population. And in that effort, it has really put a greater focus on the need for us to do more prevention. Because if we're going to be providing health care to a much larger group of people in the United States, we can only manage if we have fewer people getting sick. 
So we are really striving to come up with some creative ways that we can do prevention within the resources that we have available. So what I wanted to spend time talking with you about today is my experience and some of the challenges that I work with daily in my role as interim dean for the School of Health and Human Services, and also in my role as president of my professional organization, the Society for Public Health Education. I want to introduce you to my school. I am uh, part of a university that has four distinct schools. And within the school where I am dean, we actually have six different departments. I share this with you because I think it is somewhat unique that we have this interdisciplinary laboratory, if you will, for doing education. Our public health students are working side by side with our nursing students, social work, exercise science, recreation and leisure studies. We have communication disorders where we're working with issues related to autism, and other communication challenges from stroke and other disorders. And all of these individuals who are studying and all of the faculty who are teaching have very close opportunities to talk with one another and think about creative ways that we can meet the patient and the public community needs for healthcare and creative ways that we can deliver sharing our resources and being more efficient. So we are somewhat unique in our structure and I think it has afforded us some unique opportunities to do some pilot programs. We're looking forward to a new building that is to be uh, built on our campus over the next three years that will afford us an opportunity to have all of these departments eventually under one roof where we would even have more opportunities for collaboration. As I said, I'm also the president of my professional organization, the Society for Public Health Education. This is a nonprofit professional organization that's based in Washington, DC. And as you can see, the mission of the organization to provide global, global leadership to the profession of health education and health promotion. And as president of that organization, I have the privilege of talking to people about the profession of health education. And that's what I'm going to spend time doing today, is sharing with you this wonderful, growing profession of health education specialists that is really being integrated into the solutions for some of our healthcare challenges in the United States right now. I share this with you because I'm hopeful that there'll be some portion of this that you find valuable in the way you think about some of your public health challenges. Some of it may be relevant and some of it may not translate very well at this particular time. But I always think it's good to hear about other experiences and how people are solving problems because there are always little nuggets of information that can be helpful to us all. And the Society for Public Health Education, I just wanted to mention, we have three professional journals that I would encourage you to look at if you have them in your database here at the library, I'm not sure, but um, I'm on the editorial board for Health Promotion Practice. And this is a wonderful journal, and we are looking to expand the amount of international publications, and we would like to add more people to our reviewer pool who are from uh, other countries. So I would encourage you to look at that journal. What you're going to find in health promotion practice are very, very practical case studies where people are delivering health promotion programs. A lot of outcome data on those programs, evaluation, needs assessment, things that you're taught in your public health curriculum. Health education and behavior is a little bit more focused on theory, health behavior, uh, social types of um, research. 
And then we have a brand new journal, and that's our pedagogy journal that we just launched. And that focuses on teaching, the scholarship of teaching and learning specific to health education. Getting back to our program at Southern Connecticut State University, we have a master's program and a bachelor's program in public health. And we are accredited through the Council on Education for Public Health, also we refer to as CEF. This is a busy slide, but it really summarizes our master's program in public health. We've been accredited since 1998, and we have a core that is not so different from this university. I looked at your curriculum online in our core and our interdisciplinary competencies are very, very similar. Where we differ from many places is that we have very intentionally made a decision to have a specialization in health promotion. And we have a set of courses and competencies that we utilize from an organization NCHEC, the National Commission for Health Education Credentialing, that provides the framework for that education. And that is included in every master student's curriculum in our program. Where we are based in Connecticut, there are three MPH programs, University of Connecticut, Yale University, and Southern Connecticut State University. So we have carved out a niche for ourselves as being focused on educating those who are going to stay in Connecticut, work in Connecticut, and be in our communities, in our agencies. So our need was to do health promotion as a specialization in order to accomplish that goal. We also have a bachelor's program in public health. And I have found as I've been talking to people here on this visit that that's a new concept to many people. But we've actually had a bachelor's degree program for over 20 years at Southern Connecticut State University. Since the accrediting agency started accrediting bachelor's degree programs approximately six years ago, those programs have started to grow in the United States. And we are now at a point where there are 103 accredited bachelor's degree programs now that focus around health education, and 24 of them specifically award bachelor's degree programs, bachelor's degrees in public health. So this is something that's fairly new in the United States, the concept of doing undergraduate public health education. But again, we have decided very intentionally to focus these programs largely on the issues of health promotion, because those are the needs in our community. And as we look at healthcare reform right now, we are finding that those are where the needs are in us achieving the goals of doing more effective prevention work. Academic institutions go through accreditation. If we really wanna validate the skills and the competencies of individuals, however, we have other systems that we can utilize. And we have decided to adopt a system of a certification for individuals. And the National Commission for Health Education Credentialing, who provides our competencies, also is the agency that does certification for health education specialists. This is, um, a certification program that's been around since 1988. They certify at a basic level and at a more advanced level. And currently we have in the United States approximately 13,000 people who've achieved this health education specialist certification. What's really interesting for me, having been in the public health department at Southern Connecticut State University for 16 years, is to see the change that has gone on in terms of hiring over that period of time. Initially, many of the employers in our communities did not understand what students could do who had a bachelor's degree in public health. So we had to embark on a, a journey of educating them about what students could do and what kind of competencies they had. And the curriculum, as you saw, is not 
so unlike the MPH curriculum. It's just not at quite the advanced level. But those students are still capable of doing needs assessment and program evaluation and delivering effective health education to communities. And we had to get that word out. What we are finding is that it has been working. While I was preparing this presentation, I get constant emails, and one of them popped up, and it was a job announcement for MD Anderson Cancer Center. And it was for a health education specialist. And I noticed what they were requiring. They were looking for a bachelor's degree in public health, and they were preferred that the person have the CHES certification, the Certified Health Education Specialist. More and more, this is what we're seeing, is a real demand, uh, a lot of jobs for people who have these skills as health educators. And so we have been pursuing this as an association, the Society for Public Health Education. We effectively lobbied and we spent some time uh, in our political system in Washington, D.C., to actually get the health education job into the Bureau of Labor Statistics classification. And I'm not going to read that to you, but you can see the specific definition of a health educator that's been adopted. And in the United States, that's rather important, because once you have a very specific label for a job, you can start to count how many people are in that profession, and as a profession, you can begin to grow. And at the time, uh, the last tally on the data, there were over 58,000 health educators who were classified with this job description. Now, in terms of looking at this as a potential way to look at your workforce needs for delivering prevention and solving some of your public health challenges, I would guide you toward the framework document that was recently revised with an extensive survey of people out in the field who were working and with employers. Very extensive survey was done to see what are employers looking for and what are the needs and the health educators themselves, what are they needing from their education. And this document is available online. If you go to ncheck.org, you can pull this document up. And it is the framework we use for our curriculum in our public health program. And it's also a framework that can be used to evaluate, plan programs and curriculum and do continuing education. In order to do the CHES certification, you need to have a degree and you need to also um, have it in a specific field or, this is something that's new for us and been very helpful, if you have 25 credits in the U.S. system uh, from a junior college or you've gone and done your, uh, another type of credential, you can also qualify to take this exam. And this has been very helpful with uh, us considering different models for people who are working in our communities. The areas that health education specialists have competencies are doing needs assessment and assessing capacities with individuals and communities. Planning programs, implementing programs, evaluating programs, acting as a resource person to communities and individuals, administering and managing those health promotion programs, and then communicating and advocating for health education and prevention. And you can see the breakdown of how these competencies are tested with this certification at both the introductory level and the advanced level. So while I know that this system is not something that is currently in place globally, it's a journey that we're on in the United States to try to expand the workforce that can deliver the kind of health education that's needed in order to do the prevention work that we need to do. And it has really been an effective way for us to get people who are very specifically trained on designing appropriate, culturally appropriate programs, delivering and implementing and then evaluating those programs. Those are the types of individuals we really want in our communities 
putting programs together that are more likely to produce the kind of outcomes we're looking for sometimes when we have individuals who have medical training exclusively these skill sets just are not competencies that have been focused on and so sometimes programs are developed that are not necessarily culturally relevant not necessarily well planned with needs assessment and assessments of capacities in communities these are things that health educators are taught to do and should have the ability to do quite effectively there are many stories of successful health education efforts going on in the United States and abroad um, we have some tremendous uh, success stories in New Haven where we've been doing some community work assessing we're doing a study I've been working closely with the Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholars which is a group of physicians that are training in community-based research and there are efforts to do everything from gun violence resiliency in our communities breastfeeding with text messaging from health educators trying to promote women to do breastfeeding after giving birth. We have programs in the schools to promote physical activity with children. We have programs in the community to get people exercising every generation. We have all kinds of programs that are being delivered effectively by health educators. And this has been a tremendous success. Another group that really is a group that I think many people who are working in developing nations have perfected and the U.S. has been slow to adopt is another population of people who can help us with workforce needs and that's a population of workers we call community health workers. This won't be new to many of you who are out doing work in developing nations working in distressed communities but in the u.s it's fairly new for us to be thinking about delivering health education using lay health workers people who do not necessarily have formal education from the university community health workers are defined as frontline public health workers who have a close understanding of the community that they serve these are members of the community. These are people who have the authentic experience and are experiencing the challenge in their neighborhoods that we're trying to address in public health practice. They often serve as intermediaries between social service and public health delivery and facilitate the implementation of programs in ways that are much more culturally relevant because of their presence in the process. Um, other titles you may hear, lay health workers, community health advocates, and among our Latino community, promotores is a, a very common um, job that's, that's utilized to do this work. What we're finding with our community health workers is that requirements vary greatly between communities, states, and throughout different regions. And there are efforts going on right now to try to create a more uniform definition and set of training and competencies for community health workers. Typically, community health workers have at least a high school diploma and extensive on-the-job training that's done. But some states have gone much further. Recently, there's some wonderful examples coming out of the universities and actually the state of Minnesota has made tremendous progress in developing the community health worker model. They are having some wonderful outcomes that they've reported on their website. They have some training programs that are available publicly for community health workers and for program managers to implement training for community health workers. And what's especially wonderful for us in the United States is that the state of Minnesota has been successful in getting billing for community health worker services. And that's a big deal in the United States because of how we do healthcare um, payment systems. Another example um, with really well-developed community health worker resources is the state of Florida. 
this is a website that the Minnesota State Department, State of Minnesota put up. And it's a resource specifically tailored to using community health workers in relation to mental health service delivery. And I saw on your agenda that that's one of the topics you'll be addressing later today. There is some wonderful outcomes that are being reported by the Department of Health for the state of Minnesota with regard to mental health work with community health workers. And if you go to this resource, you'll see that there is a training program here and other resources that are publicly available. I want to wrap up with one example if you're interested in learning more about this community health worker model. And I know that those of you that are doing work in, in communities probably are already using these authentic community members in your practice. But there are some interesting case studies that are going on in some of our communities that may be interesting to you and might have some, some relevance to your practice. I think one of my favorite is the work that's going on at Latino Health Access. In Los Angeles, this agency started in the early 90s and a very inspirational woman, America Bracho, has done tremendous work in the Los Angeles area with the Hispanic community. And her, I looked for something that I could refer you to and I found this TED talk that she did not too long ago. And I would highly recommend if you wanna give yourself 20 minutes of pleasure to go on this link and watch her presentation, which is truly inspiring. What she has done is challenged us who work in public health to think differently about who is most effective in helping people to change behavior and in motivating people to do prevention. And her work in Los Angeles has really taken people who are in the neighborhoods, enlisted them in defining the problems, enlisted them in creating the solutions, and then enlisted them in being the workforce. The promotores that she hires are women, children, elderly, all segments of the population. She hires and works with them to define the solutions to the problems the neighborhoods are experiencing. And the outcomes are profound. Very, very successful. We're doing a lot of this work in New Haven we're taking a community-based research approach to the work that we're doing. We're going into communities and we're trying to find out from those community members what their needs are and how we can best provide services and build capacity so that they can own those prog programs as they leave. And I think if you go to this particular scenario and, and take a look at this video clip and this interview from America, I think you will find a very inspiring story about how community groups really can own their own problems in ways that are solutions we may never have come up with on our own. So I, I leave you with um, just an encouragement for your efforts to address the smoking issue in your country. We um, have had a long journey in the United States and this fall, our campus will go smoke free, which is a big step for us uh, to be a university that's completely smoke free. Um, we've got fairly low rates of smoking on our campus, but to be completely smoke free and people not be able to go outside and smoke a cigarette on any part of the campus is gonna be new territory for us. But as we were touring around with your president this morning, we learned that you have been leaders in that regard here at this university and you are a smoke-free campus so you went there first and we're excited to be following you soon i hope that sometime we will have an opportunity to see some of you if you are ever ever in our part of the world we hope that you'll visit us and let us extend to you um, the kind of hospitality that you've extended to us while we've been here i Hope that there's been some value in you learning a little bit about the American system. 
our shift from focusing exclusively on master's level public health workforce and looking a little bit more broadly at bachelor's degree trained health education specialists is a big shift for us but it's really paying off in terms of expanding our workforce and allowing us to address prevention in ways we could not have otherwise it's helping us because Health education specialists are so specifically trained to do this work. These are the competencies that they have. And the community health workers are the authentic change agents for their communities. And we need to be acknowledging those who have that authentic wisdom. We need to honor that. And if we do, if we're bold enough to give up some of our power to these other parts of the workforce, the rewards are tremendous because the most effective outcomes really do come from the people themselves wanting to make change, creating the change, and sustaining the change because it's their community, it's their family, and that's really where change happens. So I hope that you have a wonderful symposium for the rest of this time, and again, thank you so much for welcoming me and having me as a guest today. Thank you, Dr. Barbara, for a comprehensive presentation and emphasizing again the importance of public health professionals. Uh, we are much younger than the system that you have presented. The School of Public Health at AUA was established exactly 20 years ago, and we have produced over 200 graduates from the Master of Public Health program. And we have had a very active research center and some of its work we will present today. Thank you. Thank you. So, our first speaker is uh, Nune Truzian, who is a senior researcher in the Center for Health Services Research and Development of the AUA School of Public Health. She's going to talk about bold innovation to improve tuberculosis care in Armenia, which is a randomized clinical trial, and she's going to present for the first time in Armenia the results. So we are sharing these results with big audience for the first time. Today I will pre thank you. Today I will present, present bold innovation strategy on tuberculosis treatment in Armenia. Uh, that was conducted in 2014-2015 uh, by Center of Health Services Research and Development of the School of Public Health of American University of Armenia, with a close co collaboration with the National TB Tuber Control Program and with the financial support of the Grand Challenges Canada. So I will talk about tuberculosis today. What is tuberculosis? It's a communicable disease that uh, caused by the micro, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is occurs in the lung and other organs of people. When tuberculosis is located in the lung, it's called pulmonary tuberculosis. In other organs, it is extrapulmonary. 
There is other classification of tuberculosis as drug sensitive and drug resistant tuberculosis. When patients treated by first line anti tuberculosis drug, that this is the drug sensitive tuberculosis. When mycobacterium become resistant to either of the first line uh, drugs, at least one, it becomes drug resistant tuberculosis. There is another severe form of drug resistant tuber tuberculosis, such as multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and ex ex extensively drug resistant tuberculosis, which are nowadays is epidemiological problem worldwide. Uh, about TB patients, they are classified by smear positive and smear negative. When, when patients are able to uh, release in the air enough quantity of microbacterium, uh, they are smear positive and infectious to other people. Smear negative patients are not infectious to other people. So epidemiology of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is one of the 10 leading causes of death worldwide. One of the top three killers of women in the world. In 2012, 8.6 million new cases was reported worldwide and 1.3 million TB related cases related death was occurred. In Armenia, it is one of the major public health problems. Among, uh, Armenia is among 18 high TB priority countries according to the WHO statistics of 2014, and it is one of the 26 high MDR TB burden countries in the world. By national tuberculosis control statistics, in 2013, the incidence of tu tuberculosis reached 37 per 100,000 population. TB services in Armenia provided by the National Tuberculosis Control Center that follows the international stop TB strategy and uh, implementing the WHO recommended DOT strategy, which is directly absorbed treatment when patients taking tuberculosis drugs at the healthcare provider's supervision in the polyclinic. So the tuberculosis services provided in two stages, its intensive phase of treatment and continuation phase, and it takes place in hospital and TB outpatient centers. What was the rationale of our study? There was an evidence, local evidence, that the uh, DOT strategy in Armenia does not work properly. So TB patient does not follow uh, TB treatment properly during continuation phase and existing survey demonstrated that up to one third of patients, uh, TB patients reporting adherence to DOT strategy. There is also other evidence of international literature. There is no evidence that DOT compared to the self-administered drug intake are uh, uh, better than treatment, uh, better in treatment outcome in each of um, strategy. And there is strong evidence that involving family members in the uh, TB treatment of, or any treatment of patients is help them to adhere to treatment. So the aim of our study was to evaluate a multi-stage, multi-component innovative strategy for recommending nation, nationwide policy change. It will lead to improve drug intake compliance during outpatient treatment to improve the rates of successful treatment outcome, leading to reduction in the TB burden in the country. We apply cluster randomized control trial, which means that randomization was done in the level of clusters. Clusters were TB outpatient centers. From 60 TB outpatient centers that work in Armenia, in Yerevan and all regions, we selected 52. Uh, according to the number of patients they served annually. So those TB cabinets that are not serving more less than five patients annually, we excluded from the study to not influence our uh, power of our study. So those 52 TB outpatient centers were randomly stratified into two groups, intervention and control groups, uh, having 26 centers in each arm. Target population was selected based on inclusion ex and exclusion criteria. Inclusion criteria were that it should be tuberculosis patients with drug-sensitive pulmonary tuberculosis, starting their continu continuation phase of treatment 
uh, between March and December 2014, being at least 18 years of age at the time of recruitment, and have ability to communicate in Armenian. Only TB patients that follow the home-based TB treatment program conducted by National Tuberculosis Control Program in Yerevan outpatient centers were excluded from the study. Let's see how flow of TB patient and inclusion in our study was done. So all smear, sputum smear positive and negative patients start their treatment in, in intensive phase um, inpatiently. So from after, uh, after completion of inpatient treatment, which takes from two to three months, they refer to, to their outpatient TB centers, which is uh, the place of their living. So it's considered as a place of residency of TB patients. In this stage, we start uh, recruiting TB patients in both intervention and control arm. So those patients who were assigned to the uh, TB centers that were in our intervention cluster become our intervention patients. And those who were referred to the uh, TB centers of the control arm become our control patients. Totally, we have 180, uh, 195 patients in the intervention arm and 200 patients in the control arm. Along with recruiting of TB patients, we also ask them to indicate some of family members who they think the best will help them during the treatment by supporting. So regardless of in which arm was patient in intervention or control, they have one family member assigned to each patient if they have family and have um, such a supporter to each patient. Uh, the same uh, activities in intervention and control are always done in regards of baseline and follow-up survey only. So all patients of intervention and control arm pass the baseline and follow-up survey. In addition to this, uh, patient in the intervention arm also was participated in the set of activities uh, of our intervention. It was education and counseling for drug-sensitive TB patients and their family members, conducted by the trained team of uh, professionals, which include psychologists and TB nurse, self-administered drug intake supervised by trained family members, so they have to take medication every day except Sunday, at home by the supervision of family members. We uh, send daily SMS reminder messages every morning to them to remind them to take pills and, send the, and make daily phone calls at the evening to family members to confirm that the patient took medication and complete the side effect form if there was any. Uh, so the baseline and follow-up survey include the following sections. It demographic information, TB knowledge, smoking and alcohol, alcohol practice of our participants, stigma scale, depression, uh, quality of life, health status of participants, and family social support. In addition to baseline uh, questions, follow-up survey also include TB treatment adherence and evaluation of counseling sessions. Uh, information and so social psychology counseling was done for uh, at least TB patient and supporter of TB patient and not restricted to participate any other uh, family member, their neighbors or friends. So the counseling covered history of tuberculosis, its transmission, pathogenesis, TB disease, diagnosis of TB, treatment of TB, adherence to TB treatment, drug-resistant TB, infectiousness, infection control, and importance of psychological and social support for TB patients. Materials were provided through AUSHSR training manuals, TB brochure, TB flip chart of the National TB Control Center, and informational leaflets for tuberculosis patients and their family members. Uh, as I said, uh, Intervention patients have to visit TB centers once a week, a week, so to have checkups by the TB physician at least once a week, to assess their side effects if there were any, to receive the whole amount of pills for the upcoming week set in the seven days pill boxes provided by the doctor, 
and new drug intake and side effect form. So each patient from the intervention arm during week took the medication, complete the side effect form, and return it to the TB physician for the next visit and receive another portion of medication for the following week. So study was assessed in two levels. It's primary outcomes and secondary outcomes. Primary outcomes were considered as a TB patient treatment outcome in both intervention and control arms. And from secondary outcome, I will talk today only about three of them, TB knowledge, stigma, and family social support. Now results. Here we, you can see that how many patients with response rates we uh, recruited in the study. In the intervention arm, as I said, it was 195 patients with a response rate 85.2 at the baseline and 81.5 at the follow-up follow compared to baseline. For control arm, we recruited 200 patients with 94.8 response rate at the baseline and 83 at the follow-up. For family supporters, the response rates were uh, 95.7 at baseline and 79.6 at follow-up and 100 at baseline for control arm and 66.4 at follow-up. Here is social demographic characteristic of our participants. You can notice that across uh, intervention and control arms for TB patient and family supporters, data are about the same, they are very similar, which means that randomization worked properly. So uh, our participants were in their middle 45, in their middle 40s, from 45 to 47. Uh, TB patients mostly were males, while family supporters were females, you can see. They were in majority married. Most of them uh, were, have education, school or less. About quarter had te professional technical ed education and only 12 to 13 percent of them had institute university education. About third of TB participants had alcohol abuse during their life. Uh, more than half of them were current smokers and about 40-43% of uh, TB patients experienced migrant laboring during their life. For the wealth status of our participants, their family were considered uh, in the great majority as average and poor. 8% uh, of, uh, of TB patients had no family supporter or live alone and have four, uh, in average, four family members in their household, including children. So the primary outcome of our study was the success rate of the patient. It was success, loss to follow-up, failure, and death. This is the uh, categorization of the WHO of the treatment outcomes. No association found between being in the intervention of control group and treatment outcomes, as, can, as you can see. So uh, in, in regards of success rate, our intervention patient was as much successful as control patients. Self-reported adherence to treatment. Because initially it was said that our intervention patient uh, should attend the uh, TB center once a, a week. Adherence to this predefined policy uh, was the following. Patient and family members reported that they in 100% adhere to this requirement. While in control arm, you can see that only 86.7% of patients follow the DOT strategy, so attending the TB center six times a week except Sunday. And family member reported only 80% of attendance of their TB patient to the clinics uh, every day except Sunday. So among those who did not follow DOT strategy, 50% reported that the, they attend TB centers two to three times a week. 36% reported attendance one time a week. And there were even patients who 14% of patients who reported that they attend centers only one or two times a month. So about one-fifth of the TB patients from our control arm did not follow the national DOT strategy. Here is the result of our second outcome uh, is TB knowledge. 
the knowledge was measured by the 31 item scale and by comparing of mean cumulative present knowledge score between baseline follow-up and intervention and control arm. In the first two columns in each intervention and control group, you can see baseline follow-up mean present cumulative score following the by uh, significant p-value of difference between baseline follow-up. At the at very end, p, big p-value demonstrates the difference between intervention and control arm. So you can see that in both intervention and control arm across TB patient and family supporters, that was statistically significant knowledge improvement from baseline to follow-up and from intervention to between intervention and control. However, you can also notice that uh, knowledge gained by the intervention group was much more at follow-up than uh, by patient in the control arm with p-value 0.002 and also indicate that the uh, knowledge gained by family supporters were more than the knowledge gained by TB patient because family members were, were the primary target of our intervention training part. We think that this is proof and a success of our program. Stigma within family. Stigma within family was measured uh, according to nine item 26 point scale validated internationally and mean cumulative percent stigma score shows that the stigma among TB patients and family supporters were not so high. But uh, however, family supporters were more stigmatized than TB patients. And you can see even that the, there were no difference between intervention and control arms. A sigma substantially decreased from the baseline to follow up in both group intervention and control. Family social support. Family social support was measured by two different set of questions for TB patients and different for family member supporters. So TB patient answered the question regardless of receiving their support and family supporters in terms of providing support. For TB patient, it was 15 item scale with 45 points, and for family supporters, 14 items with 42 points. Uh, you can notice that all our participant family supporters were very supportive to their patients. Uh, the support score reached to 95, 96, 97 even the percent in the intervention in, in both intervention and control arm. In this situation when initial score are so high, it is very difficult to intervene it and make any implementation to somehow increase it. So nevertheless, you can see that between intervention and control arm, our patients who were in the intervention arm received more social support than the control arm they reported at the follow-up with marginal significant difference of 0.057 in the last column you can see. Limitation of our study. In this stage, the main limitation is the statistical analysis were done without adjusting for the cluster design effect. We did not, uh, be, uh, we, was not be, we, we were not able to do the statistical analysis with the adjustment because we had very short time. Our data collection uh, closed just a month ago and we will do this adjustment in the next future and we'll prepare uh, our papers according to that adjustment. Another limitation is that the, because of trial, potential improved provider behavior could be in the place. So because of the trial itself, the providers could behave differently in the control arm. Conclusions and recommendations. Initially, our study was set as a um, superiority study, so we expect that our treatment outcome will be better in intervention arm than in control arm. However, we saw that it is was just the same in, two, in both two groups, which is uh, not so bad because it shows that it is as good as the DOT strategy provided, uh, recommended by WHO. 
and in, it is also confirmed the international data that two type of strategies, central administered treatment and DOT, are the good same. So for drug sensitive TB patients, more efficient and less burdensome alternative strategy or weekly visits supported by the SMS reminders and family member support achieved compared clinical effectiveness to the traditional DOT that requires daily clinical visits. Reducing the number of visits to the TB outpatient centers from six to one time per week substantially reduced the, the workload of TB healthcare providers save financial resources that spent on the transportation cost of TB patients, save time to TB patient, make it more feasible for the, TB, for the TB patient to adhere to the prescribed schedule. Some of the re release resources could be used for the counseling session and reminder SMS messages and phone calls. We recommend selectively implement the new strategy as part of the national strategy in Armenia for those patients who have supportive family members to support self-administered drug intake. Contact the educational counseling session, not in the outpatient phase as we did in the continuation phase, but during intensive phase of treatment to reflect the um, drop out from the treatment from intensive phase to the continuation phase because we noticed that many patients lost to follow up of their treatment from the intensive phase due to majorly due to migrant work they just stop their treatment after in inpatient phase and leave yes so we're, we recommend implementing of educational part component of the strategy in the intensive phase Strengthening and improving the system of inpatient intensive TB care with proper coordination of transition from inpatient to outpatient TB treatment phase. This is a research team that worked during this one and a half years. Uh, and I want to thank the National Tuberculosis Control Center for uh, constant collaboration and providing support throughout the study. All our data collectors, psychologists, and uh, TB nurses that w were with us the, during those one and a half years. Thank you. And I'm open for your question after the next presentation. All we can do now. So we will finish the second presentation on tuberculosis and we will open the floor for questions. Thank you. It's my honor to be here today and present this work. As we've heard today, tuberculosis is a major public health issue in Armenia and worldwide. And another problem is how diabetes influences on TB treatment. And I, as a public health student, uh, was interested in this issue and explored this phenomenon within the scope of my master thesis project in the School of Public Health. Today's presentation is about that project, and it is called The Influence of Diabetes Mellitus on Treatment Outcomes of Patients with Pulmonary Tuberculosis. So we are going to have 10 minutes presentation. Uh, the first few slides are a little bit of information about the association of diabetes and tuberculosis, what we know from the literature, and a little information about the burden of diabetes in Armenia. Then I'm going to spend some time talking about the research question and the methods of the study. Uh, then I will talk about the main results of this project. In the end, I will have a discussion about the main findings and present recommendations. So epidemiological studies found an association between having diabetes and development of TB. A systematic review found that people with diabetes are at three times higher risk to develop TB than people without diabetes. And a number of investigations have shown that T 
TB treatment among patients infected with TB and having diabetes, TB treatment has poor outcomes. More specifically, diabetes increases the risk of failed treatment and death among patients with tuberculosis. So the situation in Armenia related to diabetes is the following. Diabetes is third leading cause of death and reached to 8.9% of total death in 2011. According to the National Institute of Health, the incidence of diabetes among patients, among people uh, 15 and over year old, the incidence uh, has increased from 96 to 265 per 100,000 population from 2000 to 2010. The public health importance for our investigation was the following. No prior study investigated the association between TB and diabetes in Armenia, and an investigation of the association of diabetes and TB treatment outcome is very important and would help to improve the care and TB treatment of patients with TB and diabetes. The research question of our re study was uh, the following. Does the outcome of TB treatment differ among pulmonary TB patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes compared to the TB patients without diabetes after adjusting for other factors influencing the TB treatment outcome in Yerevan, Armenia? So this uh, the retrospective court study design was considered the most appropriate for this investigation because using already an existing database and medical records was comparatively cost-effective and not time-consuming. The study had to compare some groups, uh, exposed and non-exposed. TB patients with diabetes were in the exposed group and those patients without diabetes in non-exposed group. TB patients were considered to have diabetes if they had uh, the diagnosis of diabetes recorded in their medical cards. Uh, based on the feasibility, because of the feasibility issues, the study has narrowed down to Yerevan City, and we included all adults with pulmonary tuberculosis who were registered in Yerevan outpatient TB care facilities and whose treatment outcomes were recorded in the database of the National Tuberculosis Control Center for the period January 2013 to December 2014. Exclusion criteria for our study population were having missing or incomplete medical record or being transferred out of Yerevan during their TB treatment as the follow-up of the entire uh, period of their treatment was not possible. Uh, the main dependent variable of the study was WA, um, um, TB treatment outcome based on WHO definition, including successful treatment, treatment failure, le death, and loss to follow up. And the main interest of the independent variable of the interest was presence or absence of diabetes. Based on the literature, we choose factors that uh, other studies suggested to be related with our treatment outcome, uh, that, are, that is the dependent variable, and based on the availability of this information, we came up with the following list of control variables. Age, gender, weight, having HIV AIDS, the type of tuberculosis, uh, the sputum's mass status in the beginning of the treatment, having uh, previous TB treatment history, the time of diabetes diagnosis, combined form of tuberculosis, having cancer, hepatitis C, liver cirrhosis, pneumonia, and renal failure. The data collection consisted of two main stages and was conducted in NTCC uh, office and our outpatient TB facilities and the prison hospital of Yerevan. During the first stage of the data collection, the study team had reviewed the list of uh, the database of uh, National Tuberculosis Control Center to obtain the list of all eligible TB cases and the necessary variables. And during the second stage of the data collection, we co collected information on comorbidities, height and weight of the patients from their medical records in outpatient TB facilities and in the prison hospital of Yerevan. After data collection, clean, uh, data entry, cleaning and recording, uh, we used independent sample t-test and chi-square chi test to compare the baseline characteristics of study population in both groups. 
Then a binary logistic regression was conducted to assess uh, first the crude odds ratio between dependent and independent variables. Then a final model was constru constructed to con control for the variables, uh, for contr uh, confounders. So uh, in the initial sample size uh, that was obtained from the uh, NTCC electronic database was 839. Then, uh, in the beginning of the data collection, uh, one of the outpatient facilities who had uh, medical records of 159 patients refused to participate in the study, resulting uh, in a response rate of 81%. During the second stage of the data collection, uh, 59 patients were excluded because 12 of them were transferred out of Yerevan or Armenia, therefore they were not eligible for the uh, study, and 47 patients were excluded because of the missing or incomplete me medical records. So the final sample of uh, medical records that we have re reviewed was 621. In uh, 621 patients, the 30, 36 had diabetes, and compared the prevalence of diabetes among TB patients uh, was 2.2 times higher compared to the uh, prevalence of diabetes among general population in Armenia. This table represents the proportions of treatment outcome categories based on diabetes status. Uh, the success rate in diabetic groups was 72% uh, approximately, and in non-diabetic groups approximately 83%. The death rate uh, in diabetic groups was approximately 8% and approximately 6% in non-diabetic groups, and the failure outcome uh, rate was approximately 11 and approximately 12% in diabetic and non-diabetic groups respectively. Loss to follow-up, uh, was 8.3% in diabetic groups and approximately 10% in non-diabetic groups. This second table uh, presents the baseline characteristics of study population again by their diabetes status. Uh, in both groups, uh, the patients were statistically significantly different only with regard to their age and weight. People with diabetes were older and heavier than uh, TB patients without diabetes. And um, the, in both groups, the majority of the patients were male, had drug-sensitive type of tuberculosis, and were new identified cases without having previous TB treatment history. For the final analysis, we separated cases with death and loss to follow up, as the risk factors associated with these outcome categories were different and our modified outcome variable had two options, failure and success. This is multivariate logistic regression model where we included uh, the only confounder that was uh, the only variable that was confounding the relationship between diabetes and failure treatment outcome. After adjusting for the weight, the odd ratio of the association of diabetes and failure treatment outcome was 9.5. 49, meaning that the odds of failing treatment was approximately nine times higher among TB patients with diabetes compared to the TB patients without diabetes. Beside that model, we had a predictive uh, model where we cl included not only the confounding variables, but also those factors that theory suggests to be related with our outcome variables, that is failure treatment outcome. As you see that uh, factors are age, being male, weight in the beginning of the treatment, have, being spotum smear positive in the beginning of the treatment, drug resistant type of tuberculosis, having previous TB treatment history, and having HIV. So, presented retrospective cohort study found that uh, the prevalence of diabetes among TB patients is higher compared to diabetes, um, prevalence of diabetes among general population. The main hypothesis of our study, whether diabetes is associated with less favorable treatment outcome, was supported by our research, 
showing that people with TB patients with diabetes are more likely to fail their TB treatment compared to TB patients without diabetes. Uh, this association of TB and diabetes is especially risk for populations which carry high burden of both TB and diabetes. As uh, diabetes is estimated to increase rapidly and it is moving from high to low income countries, it is very likely that soon diabetes will surpass HIV as a risk factor for tuberculosis. And our uh, study was the first to evaluate the relationship between diabetes and TB treatment outcome in Armenia. Uh, only medical diagnoses were used to define cases with diabetes, HIV, and other comorbidities. And uh, there were no any, any self-reported diagnosis or a case defined by the study team. Another strength was the inclusion of all TB facilities that provide outpatient TB care in Yerevan and conducting a census of target population. And of course, our study revealed several limitations that need to be discussed. Uh, the medical cards varied between outpatient TB facilities and the way of recording information on comorbidity was different. Besides this limitation, it was impossible to control for some variables that based on the literature might be related with our outcome variable that are socioeconomic status, smoking status, alcohol and drug use, type of diabetes, length of diabetes, body mass index, and glucose level in the blood. Based on the study results, we are making the following recommendations. Uh, to enforce mechani uh, mechanisms should be developed to enforce the MOH guidelines for screening of diabetic patients for TB and screening TB patients for diabetes. Uh, the treatment guidelines might be revised to accurately address the treatment of TB patients with diabetes. And uh, prospective court studies need to evaluate the same hypothesis, however, continu continuously collecting data on potential confounders that this study missed, particularly the glucose level in the blood, uh, alcohol and smoke, uh, uh, alcohol usage, drug usage, and smoking status. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to introduce Serine. Serine Sahakyan uh, just started to work uh, in the Center for Health Services Research and Development as a research assistant. So Nune and Serene join me so that we can answer questions from the audience. It's needed for... I would, ask you, uh, would like you to ask if you had any uh, mothers with infants in your uh, trial. Did you have any patients like that? We had, pa we had patients who just had gave birth. Uh, it was complicated case of family where both wife and husband had tuberculosis and met each other in the hospital. Huh. Yes, <laughs> got married and had children. So Have tuberculosis can be some, sometimes very painful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would like to know if, there, if you know, it's not related to your study, sorry for asking this, but I would like to know if they were advised to drop breastfeeding or what they, were they advised, they, you don't know? Um, in our training materials we have that point. So mm -hmm. we say that it is better to feed child, breastfeed child, than, than give, otherwise. Yes, because to give it some gives drugs also to the child if she, the, there is a need. The effect to of breastfeeding is much higher than the TB drugs, so it increases the immune system of child. Mm -hmm. So it is much better to feed than do not feed. So the, uh, the doctors recommend it yes. also. Thank you very much. It was important for me. 
Chair, please use the microphone. Uh, Nune, first of all, congratulations, great study. Thank I you. was wondering, that's a little bit state of the art using SMS to communicate with patients, which is something we're talking more and more about. Did you think about doing a third arm where you had no family member involved, but just had SMS reminders? Yes, sure, we applied SMS reminders for all patients, regardless of having family member or not. So our patients who did not have family members were trained as a family member. So they did both self-administered drug and a supervision of themselves. No, unfortunately, we couldn't have a separate group because of lack of money. Yeah. Um, Serena, you mentioned briefly at the end that diabetes is going to surpass HIV as a risk factor for tuberculosis. Can you elaborate on that and what the mechanism is? Okay, thank you for your question. Well, uh, because of the industrialization and uh, movement to the urban areas, diabetes is going to be increased and it is estimated by the International Diabetes Health Association that uh, in 2013 the, the prevalence of diabetes might be double. So uh, it is, and uh, there is a growing evidence that diabetes is an important risk factor for TB. Uh, and recent studies shows that the prevalence of diabetes among TB patients is higher than the prevalence of HIV. Based on these uh, findings, uh, we are, we and the researchers making that uh, um, for <laughs> yes, that uh, that conclusion. Sorry, I forgot the word. <laughs> Good job. Uh, I wonder if you also collected information about the other medications that the patients are taking. Certainly, if they're taking cortisone, then that mm -hmm. could make them uh, mm -hmm. more sensitive to tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And regarding the diabetes, both cortisone and many psychiatric medications can also raise the blood sugar. Yes, uh, thank you for your comment. We didn't, we couldn't uh, collect information on other uh, medication that patients used because uh, it was not recorded on the medical records and there and we couldn't contact the patients to ask that question. So unfortunately we couldn't. But there is a, a, a hypothesis and discussion in the literature that Anti-tuberculosis drugs also increasing the glucose level in the blood. Could I ask, answer to your question? Or? Thank you. May I ask a question to our guest? Just one small question. Thank you very much. Your presentation was inspiring. And uh, who pays your community health workers? Could you say that? Um, most of our projects are funded with grants in the United States, and we have a number of different sources. Some of them are governmental, but increasingly, our communities are reaching out to local foundations for grant money to do small-scale projects. Um, uniquely, with the Affordable Care Act and the way we're revising uh, some of our medical payment systems, states are beginning to reimburse and pay for community health workers in particular. We've seen six states do that so far. So thank you. Thank you very much. So your uh, government and foundation share the success of the health workers for promoting care of the community. My name is Seta Bogosian, I'm from England. Um, I really like to congratulate you both for this marvelous uh, study you have done on tuberculosis. 
However, I would like to understand a bit more about the study, the model we've done on the, uh, the issue of confidentiality consent, whether you've managed to obtain those uh, and what sort of, especially in contacting uh, family members in getting some information. Would you kindly elaborate in on that? Sure. We get consent form from both TB patient and their family mem mem members and TB patient provided us written consent form and the whole study passed the uh, IRB in, in International Review Board. So before starting any data collection, we have proof of study. I would like to add to that. Uh, before contacting the patients, we ask the National TB Control Center to contact first the patient, ask for their permission, then the researchers contact them. And only after that, the researchers had the opportunity to contact the TB patient. So we have followed not only our institutional review board requirements, but also the Armenian law and regulations. Thank you. At the beginning of training session, we have set of psychological question to, re uh, to reveal what kind of psychological level of distress have our TB patient and family member to make our training more precise for each family. So this is the part of the ethic. Any maybe last question? отметили, что были трудовые мигранты, которые не долечившись выехали. Они являются потенциально опасными для окружающих, и если так, то несут ли они криминальную ответственность или какие механизмы привлечь их продолжить, принудить их продолжить лечение, если это в Армении принято. And let me translate the question because some of our guests do not have uh, equipment. So the question is about migrant workers, whether they are infected and whether they are a danger to the society and whether they should be criminally prosecuted. I will answer in English, so <laughs> do not have translation. Yes, uh, migrants are... Uh, risk group among TB patients and it, there are uh, laws to follow up after intensive phase of treatment where are smear negative so they are not infectious anymore however because they stop their treatment TB can reoccur later so we don't know when it could happen uh, there are risky groups so uh, most of them probably start new treatment after being back in Armenia or starting another treatment, mostly they migra migrated to Russian Federation. We have no law to follow them and all people are free and can make their decision as they want. So no prostitution. So, uh, prostitution, <laughs> yes. Prosecution. <laughs> prosecution. Okay. <laughs> so I would like to add to that. Uh, in Armenia, TB treatment is not mandatory. Uh, it's mandatory only in the prison system, but not for the civilians. Uh, and also, if you noticed, about 40% uh, of the TB patients in both groups are, have experience of being a migrant worker. We have published with Nune another paper on uh, migrant work as a risk factor for developing drug-resistant TB because and it's also a risk factor for getting TB because people are going mainly from Armenia to Russia and they are working in regions where the prevalence of TB is much higher than in Armenia. And also because of living for migrant work, they do not complete their treatment. And right now there are no me intergovernmental mechanisms to continue for these people the treatment that they start in Armenia and hence later they develop more drug resistant types of TB. Uh, very last question because we need to uh, move forward to our next session.
My name is Pierre Braquet from uh, Médecins Sans Frontières. I have a question for Stéphane uh, Sarakia. Uh, first, uh, congratulations for uh, providing good quality uh, evidence-based uh, research in Armenia on a very hot topic. You said in your conclusion that we need uh, to improve guidelines for treating diabetes in tuberculosis patients. You talked about screening for diabetes in tuberculosis patients, mm -hmm. for screening for tuberculosis in diabetes patients. Mm -hmm. But as, a cl as clinicians, we were working a lot on this, and we were in lack of actually evidence-based uh, data to, to make these guidelines, to have reference uh, on how to treat diabetes patients for example, diabetic patients who have tuberculosis, on how to choose tuberculosis drugs for uh, TB patients. And have you any information on this subject? Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Uh, thank you for your comment and question. Uh, first, in according to uh, MOH guideline in Armenia, uh, TB uh, diabetic patients are in risk of group of developing TB, and they are they should be screened twice a year. Uh, with x-ray examination and uh, sputum smear examination to identify uh, TB potential. And TB patients uh, in the first time where they are diagnosed with TB, examine, giving glucose level analysis to identify uh, whether uh, glucose level is higher in their blood or not. Um, but however, during the data collection, we noticed that not all uh, TBK specialists are careful with this and they might miss patients with uh, uh, diabetic patients among TB, newly diagnosed TB patients. That's why we are enforce, uh, suggesting to enforce the mechanism, develop mechanism to uh, enforce these uh, guidelines. Uh, what, I'm sorry, what was your second question? Second part? This is about the drugs, whether there should be specific drugs for TB patients with diabetes. Unfortunately, we didn't review this during <coughs> our study. Can you add anything from the literature? Um, if there are special drugs for TB patients with diabetes? No, uh, I didn't find anything, uh, any guideline that uh, is revised based on those similar studies. Uh, but um, we are making this recommendation because we see that uh, the current guideline, which is uh, good for a TB patients without diabetes, doesn't work for a TB patients with diabetes. That's why we are making this recommendation. Thank you very much. Now, thank you. we're moving to another hot area, which is non-communicable diseases. And we will start with a presentation by Anahi Demirjan, who is a senior research specialist in our research center. And she and Vahe Khachaturian, who is a PhD candidate at UCLA Fielding School of Public Health, they put together the presentation on why is mental health a hot topic in Armenia, because they have been involved in many research projects that we have done on the issue of mental health. Good afternoon. Uh, I decided to speak in Armenian, but I see that all of you almost understand English, so, so I will continue in English. Uh, I will talk today about why mental health could be a hot topic in Armenia. First, about uh, the total burden of mental disorders in the world. According to WHO, 20% of patients visiting primary health care services suffer from one or more mental disorders. Mental disorders cause over 37% of healthy life year loss because of disability. Depressive and anxiety disorders are the most common types of mental disorders. And they rank first in the world worldwide world burden of disease among non communicable conditions. Just uh, a few impressive facts globally. Now about uh, some facts about depression, the most common type of mental disorders. Over two-thirds of all suicides are attributable to depression. A depression causes 24th higher risk for suicide. People with depression are four times more likely to develop a fatal heart attack. 
both the uh, probability of developing heart attack and for it to be fat fatal are higher among uh, diabetic patients, uh, with depressed patients. Depression incidence is the highest in middle ages, uh, which is not the case in Armenia. In the, uh, next slide, I, I will show you different tendency in Armenia. Depression treatment is effective in 80% of cases, at least for the current depression episode. But uh, for some reason, in developed countries, 35 to 50% of patients only seek care for depression. And in developing low and middle income countries, this proportion is much higher, uh, ranging from 76 to 85% and even higher, as you will see for Armenian case. Uh, we conducted in Center for Health Services Research and Development a number of studies related to mental health. Uh, it began from 2000 when we conducted household health survey in Sevan with the involvement of uh, 1,500 women in Sevan region. This study was a uh, two-time study and it uh, included a scale, uh, Center for Epidemiologic Studies Depression Scale, as a screening tool for depressive symptoms. And then we uh, conducted Armavir Household Health Survey using the same instrument, again, among women over 18 years old. This was conducted in 2001 and 2004. Then in 2006, we conducted countrywide household health survey, again using the same measure for depression. And uh, lastly, we conducted post-earthquake psychopathological evaluation study, so-called PEPSI study. Uh, the first uh, wave of which was conducted as early as in 1991, and the last stage, the fourth stage, in 2012. And here we used a number of scales, including the depression scale, 16 this time, and uh, adapted, adapt, adapt, adapted for Armenia. And the number of other scales measuring anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, etc. Uh, other than uh, CHSR, uh, many students, our graduates of MPH, uh, MPH course, conducted studies related to mental health. Among these, uh, there are a lot, um, uh, number of studies uh, mostly focusing on depression, depression among elderly, postpartum depression, depression among uh, foreign and Armenian medical students, depression among adolescents, PTSD and depression in the uh, uh, population groups uh, uh, that were victims of war stress, for example, in Stepanakert, or earthquake stress, for example, in post-earthquake zone. And, uh, some, uh, and the recent study of uh, one of the recent graduates uh, investigated mental health issues of mothers of children with diabetes one uh, suffering from diabetes type one. So there are a, there is a lot of interest among our graduating students, and all, all these were the topics of their theses. And uh, based on these studies, we have also a number of publications in peer-reviewed international journals. Among these, uh, mostly uh, two publications. Uh, uh, focus on postpartum depression. Two are uh, validation publications validating uh, depression scale and uh, post-traumatic st stress uh, measuring scale and uh, with some interesting findings and also uh, depression among older people in Yerevan and quality of life. This also was published by one of the graduates of MPH. Now, I will try to combine all of this and shortly to present the main interesting findings just to prove that mental health could be a hot issue in Armenia. You see here uh, the dynamics of depression. 
in Armenian. Uh, as, as I already told, we started from Gerar Kunik and Armavi regions and conducted uh, assessment of the mental health of women there three times, uh, starting from 2000 till 2006. And as you see, the prevalence rates uh, have a tendency of decreasing. And this tendency was the same in the earthquake zone. Uh, global, uh, uh, overall, the uh, Marsis are not very different in this tendency. All the Marsis show decreasing tendency during the last decade. It could be maybe just one hypothesis that it could be decreasing level of global stress experienced by people in Armenia. But still, uh, the results of the 2012 show still very high rates of possible depression among population. Uh, you can see here uh, the distribution of depression prevalence among uh, Marsis of Armenia. As you can notice, the depression is the highest in Vyodzor Mars for some reason, and is the lowest in Ararat Mars. And uh, the second highest Mars is Chirac, which is post earthquake zone, and this is more or less explainable. This is uh, our place in terms of prevalence of depressive symptoms among many cities and countries globally. And you can see that our place is not the best one. We use two different cutoffs. One which shows 31.8 prevalence rate, the highest prevalence, uses the cutoff which is uh, uh, globally uh, uh, used uh, as, as, as the main cutoff to distinguish between people depressed or not depressed. The other one, uh, this is 13, the other one, 19 cutoff, was found uh, during the study of one of our graduates. She conducted validation study of this instrument with the gold standard of uh, psychological diagnosis in the post earthquake zone and found much higher cutoff point to uh, decide whether the patient is depressed or not, or not using the SST instrument. So, with this higher uh, cutoff point, uh, the prevalence is 15% in our population, but uh, this is still rather high and in the group of uh, places with the highest prevalence of depression. This one is the place of Armenia in terms of anxiety pre prevalence. As you see again, we are much ahead from other regions and countries. But uh, one note that this prevalence was measured in the post-earthquake cohort 25 years after earthquake, but still it could be a little bit higher than the population rate. Although this region is not very much different from other Marsis, as you saw in the previous slide, and so this could be uh, closer to the reality for Armenia. The population groups at high risk for depression in Armenia, according to our uh, pu publications and studies of risk factors of depression, are the following. Socially vulnerable groups, disadvantaged groups, poor, sufferers from chronic health conditions, victims of disasters or stressful life events, uh, family caregivers, meaning that people who give care for sick family members, children or adults, women, usually the rate of uh, depression among women is uh, uh, 1.6 times higher than the rate of depression among men, and this is the case in Armenia as well as in the world. And elderly, in Armenia particularly, as I told you, Middle Ages are the most dangerous period for uh, depression globally, but in Armenia for some reason, the rates of depression uh, do not decrease. They uh, continue to increase as people get older. Here is the relation between poor poverty and depression. As you see, if there is no poverty, there is low depression. Then with moderate poverty, depression is more, <coughs> and depression is extreme with severe poverty. 
Here is health problems and depression, as you see, even between gender differ differences disappear with no health problems. But uh, with moderate health, health problems, depression rates are, are higher and uh, between gender differences appear and they increase both with severe health problems. This one is the unique pattern of age and depression association in Armenia. Uh, globally, uh, after 16, after 60 years old, the prevalence of depression decreases, ours increases. And the hypothesis, we need to make hypothesis and to look whether they are true or false. The, just a few slides about postpartum depression. The prevalence of postpartum depression is not higher in Armenia than globally. Uh, the prevalence was 13% in the meta-analysis of 59 studies, 14.4% in Yerevan, according to uh, the study of our graduate student of MPH, and 13% uh, in the Pepsi cohort study, post-earthquake psychopathological evaluation study. The predictors according to these studies again include the number of stressful life events, poor living standards, also poor outcome of the delivery in terms of stillbirth, for example, or delivering sick child. History of postpartum depression, if there is depression, postpartum depression in anamnesis, then uh, it is a risk factor, very uh, strong risk factor for current depres depressive episode postpartum. Self-reliability at baseline or self-esteem self is protective factor, the only protective factor. And child care anxiety or general anxiety. Anxiety is usually comorbid with depression. They're highly comorbid and according to some scientists, they could be even the same, the different domains of the same condition. Mental health services in Armenia. These are uh, a, a few data just to demonstrate you how much uh, the mental health services in Armenia cover the existing needs of the population in these services. Only 3% of the state expenditures on health care are devoted to mental health services. Of these, 88% are spent for inpatient care. Users of outpatient uh, mental health clinics constitute only 1.3% of the population. Of them, uh, the majority are people with schizophrenia, uh, schizoid conditions, other conditions. Only 4% of them have mood disorders, including depression. This means that only 0.05% of the depressed the, of the population applies to doctor for depression, while the prevalence of depression, according to the uh, most conservative estimates, is not less than 15%. So 15% and 0.05% of those who seek care. This is an area to talk about. The few daycare centers for mentally ill patients cover only 3 to 5 percent of the existing needs. No regular continuous education is available in the country on psychiatry and clinical psychology. And stigma is a serious obstacle for using mental health services. Here's some evidence about the stigma. In 2012, our colleague Vahek Khachaturyan and Khachatur uh, Gasparyan uh, conducted a study in the mental clinics of Yerevan um, to measure the stigma. And as you can see, 57% of uh, questions think that they don't like anyone to know about the, their or their family members' mental problem. And uh, for 45%, it is difficult to talk about their mental health problem with others while 22% are not sure, and probably they also uh, have difficulties in talking about that. This, was, is, this one is very inter interesting, the third one, that 32% of people 
think that mental illness usually develops as a result of patients' faults. And 22% are not sure whether it is true or false. Mentally ill patients are aggressive and dangerous. 22% agree with this statement, 47% are not sure. The only one which is rather uh, low percentage is that, the, that people not so much anymore think that those who apply to psychiatrists or psychologists are considered to be mentally ill. I am sure that if this uh, survey was conduct were conducted uh, in the early years of independence or, or in Soviet period, this percentage would be as high as the first, as for the first questions. These are caregiver suggestions, suggestions to improve the quality of mental health services in Armenia. As you see, this, uh, we asked these type of questions to improve in health services, of, uh, to improve health services in different areas and their answers are not very much different from answers of those about other types of health services. So increase free of charge drug supplies, this is uniform answer, and improve counseling skills of providers, eliminate informal payments, although free of charge the drug supplies, uh, if you ask uh, mental health service providers, all mental health patients, uh, can receive free of charge drug supplies, at least one in each category of drugs, and the informal pay, they don't need to pay the doctors, uh, as this is covered by state basic benefit package. But still, uh, you see that this is not the case in reality. Increase provider salaries, this is also a uniform requirement. Improve physical conditions of hospitals, improve cleanliness of hospitals, this is from the point of view of patients and their caregivers. Now, this is how to improve mental health services in Armenia from the point of view of WHO experts. This was uh, stated in the report. Developed community-based mental health services. They are lacking in Armenia. Strengthen outpatient mental health services, also very weak in Armenia. Shift resources from inpatient to outpatient services. Develop geriatric care and nursing homes for elderly. Uh, again, for mental, we don't have specifically this type of services for elderly with mental health problems. Improve mental health services for children to support their so socialization and education. Strengthen daycare system to support families with mentally disabled members which is again very much important. Improve refresher trainings of, in psychiatry and psychology. Support public education for stigma reduction, etc. These are just selected recommendations. There is a long list of more recommendations and a lot of things to do. Thank you. Thank you, Anandi. Uh, I'm sure many of our uh, people in the audience agree now that it's a hot topic in Armenia. Unfortunately, there are uh, even high-ranked professionals in Armenia who think that we don't have depression or we don't have postpartum depression in Armenia, but we do. So our next speaker is Narine Morsisyan, senior researcher at our research center, and she's going to talk about a burning topic, which is smoking and health professionals. everyone thank you for being with us today uh, I'm very pleased to share my thoughts on this my favorite topics uh, and as usually it's you know audience of the right people non-smoking ones so nevertheless uh, I have to do my job and present uh, the, the large picture I'll try to do my best. I want to uh, show you uh, the, 
WHO mortality chart on top uh, 10 causes of death in different countries, group of countries. Uh, we see here uh, but, um, Please keep the microphone closer. But actually, except that one, in any other group of countries from high income to uh, lower middle income countries, the uh, chronic disease, non-communicable disease, uh, like uh, heart disease, stroke, uh, COPD, are the main killers. So th this is, you see, the group uh, where uh, Armenia fits, belongs. So does smoking kills? Yes, it does, but it does slowly. So uh, there is no really uh, something cut about that. It is believed that every day the number of deaths to tobacco uh, induced uh, deaths is equivalent of the number of passenger, passengers of this Airbus. So should we have uh, an Airbus falling daily, we would be probably shocked. But we are not with the same amount of victims of this so-called bad habit. It is not a bad habit anymore. Smoking is not a, only a public health problem, it's a societal problem. It touches on every aspect of life, economies, um, families, environment, and of course, the health. And the response to this pro um, problem came uh, also as a global response. Uh, it is called It is called Framer Convention on Tobacco Control. You have heard about it, of course. And Armenia is a member to this international binding uh, treaty since 2004. It was a really good news for us because we have <coughs> one of the highest um, male smoking rates in the region, in, in whole Europe. Let me show you some data on smoking prevalence in Armenia. I, I um, intentionally don't give you uh, just one um, <coughs> number because, uh, you know, the numbers are really relative things. So we can um, walk through this table and see um, what, what they look like. And uh, you see that there is a, uh, some um, trend uh, of a, a decreasing trend actually from 2000 to 2010 uh, at least according to demographic and health survey which uh, has been done several times in Armenia and um, according to World Bank data uh, unfortunately I couldn't find the primary source for this World Bank data but uh, and to understand the methodology of <clears throat> generating this data, but uh, they are uh, a, lit a little bit more favorable. As you see, it gives 55%. These are numbers for men, just uh, to make sure you, you, you... We are going to talk... Uh, whenever you see numbers, it's about men. So, um, actually... Is, it sm uh, is, um, is uh, smoking a hot topic? I don't think so. Uh, um, until uh, half of men in this country smoke, I, don't, I think it's kind of social norm. So it may be a hot topic for us, public health professionals, clinicians, uh, just people with rational minds, but not, not, not to those who smoke. And there are really many. 
the um, framework convention uh, on tobacco control has a lot of uh, effective uh, strategies. So uh, th these strat uh, strategies actually were summarized in WHO Empower report, and there are six. Uh, let me name them. Monitor tobacco use, which means surveillance of tobacco use, and uh, prevention policies, tobacco control policies, protect people from tobacco smoke exposure, offer help to quit tobacco, warn about the dangers of tobacco, ban tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship, and raise taxes. So we are going to talk today about the third one, offer help to quit tobacco use. This is our responsibility as health professionals. The guidelines of Article 14 of, of the FCTC define tobacco dependent, uh, dependence treatment as the provision of behavioral support or medications or both to smokers to help them stop their tobacco use. So what can we do as health professionals? The answer is clear, offer help, but how? How is the key word? And uh, we have these, fortunately, guidelines on uh, Article 14. And so it, it's a kind of busy slide. Uh, we, uh, I, I would try to uh, summarize them in a few words. So first, we should create an infrastructure. Then, very important in my opinion, address the issue in, in ourselves, in healthcare workers. And then we can go further to integrate brief advice into existing uh, healthcare system. And then only um, provide specialist clinics. And all this treatment should be widely available, accessible, affordable, and uh, the measures should be monitored. It's easy on the paper, of course. So what, um, what do we have? Uh, at the moment in Armenia, we do have a uh, um, focal local point, not on smoking cessation, but on tobacco control. And I think it's quite enough for, for a country f uh, with uh, limited resources. Uh, we don't have a national cessation strategy, but we do have national treatment guidelines. Um, I'll show you in, in a minute the, the, uh, the picture of those guidelines. Unfortunately, these guidelines were never, you know, disseminated. They were never endorsed by, by, by health professional organizations. So they were, um, you know, there was somewhere mark that they, they were um, developed, but it's, it's just the very first step and without going farther and uh, bringing that uh, knowledge to, to the real people, to the real, uh, clinicians and physicians, it, it, it just nothing. So um, national training standards, I think it's too early to think about that without training programs, but certainly we should implement, plan and implement um, training programs for health professionals. And I will talk uh, uh, very briefly about the very first uh, that is ongoing. And another very important strategy is mandatory reporting of tobacco use in medical charts. That's quite cost-effective way of intervening. Of course, uh, funding and uh, establishing a sustainable source of funding for cessation support is an issue everywhere. Uh, I should uh, admit that Armenia is not the only country that lacks this infrastructure. It's actually the uh, least developed strategy in tobacco control everywhere, worldwide. So you, you see the um, uh, guidelines, uh, Armenian guidelines that are, were um, developed a couple of years ago, actually in 2008, I guess. And they are um, based on the U.S. guidelines. The, on, on the uh, approach is called five A's: ask, 
uh, ask the patient each time you see him, advise to quit tobacco, assess willingness uh, to quit at every visit, uh, assist by, uh, pre uh, by um, preparing a plan and uh, you know, planning for quitting day, and then arrange a follow-up uh, meeting. So it's a worldwide accepted uh, strategy, uh, but again, it's at, at the moment, it's only on the paper. And I want to refer, to reflect on, on the um, very important aspect of this project, um, problem. It's the smoking among health professionals. You see the uh, data from Global Health Profession Student Survey in 2006. It's a bit old data. However, I apologize for, for, for um, the language uh, is in Armenian. But you can see that uh, almost half of the students in Armenia uh, uh, actually reported being a smoker in 2006. Uh, the, uh, in the rows, you see uh, the faculties, the schools in the medical university. It's uh, physicians and sorry, uh, and then dentists and pharma uh, pharmacists. And uh, the, uh, the last uh, row is uh, nurses. So, uh, and the uh, right column is uh, the uh, data for Czech Republic. I, I left them as a comparison. I, I think it's, it's, it's not the US, it's closer so we can compare. And uh, you, you can uh, make conclusions yourself. We, we really uh, differ. And uh, that's a sad situation. Again, it, uh, the survey was implemented uh, in 2006. And these uh, physicians, dentists, and pharmacists are uh, the real uh, current healthcare uh, workers at the moment. We don't know, unfortunately, uh, um, what, they, what is the picture today. But we have, um, I can show and share with you some data from uh, more recent um, uh, studies. Actually, the parent st study is from 2004 and uh, our center study is 2009, and uh, I, I, I would ask uh, you to, to keep in mind that these are not the representative data, it's just very small studies. Uh, one in uh, parents' study is a cross-sectional survey in 12 facilities, and our is j uh, just in a one big uh, hospital. But you see uh, the data are quite close to the ones uh, we just saw in a previous slide. Fortunately, in 2009 data, it's a bit lower. And uh, there is another uh, silver lining in this slide, I, I, I think. It's uh, the data regarding nurses smoking. We should not um, forget ever that health professionals is not only physicians, it's also um, other professions. And first of all, in Armenia, it's about nurses. So nurses uh, as, uh, mainly uh, are female workers and they, they, they have uh, proportionate uh, smoking rates or maybe a, a bit higher than just in general population, among female part of general population. So they are um, predominantly non-smokers and they can support and um, assist their patients in quitting smoking. So it's a, um, there is a huge potential uh, here. We, we should uh, always keep it in, in mind. So um, you may know, uh, it, it, it may be uh, familiar to you, uh, this uh, code of conduct on tobacco control adopted in 2004 under the auspices of WHO. Um, I, I remember in 2005, the World No Tobacco Day uh, had this logo, Health Professionals Against Tobacco Action. Uh, so we, we uh, in Armenia, also had this uh, 
the, uh, this poster in, Armen in Armenian lang uh, language and it was kind of the code of conduct was um, endorsed by uh, a few health pr physicians organizations. However, it should be, a, you know, everyday code of conduct. It should be uh, the, uh, the plan for, for everyone, especially for the organizations. And I, I would really call upon uh, our diaspora uh, colleagues uh, to, to, uh, to raise this question every time they implement a joint program with our clinicians. To, to um, you know, to not to keep silent on this issue. I think uh, only a joint uh, effort can can bring some change. And uh, this slide from the same survey, uh, I, uh, I want to uh, just uh, uh, translate the last. Uh, Ro, cartul meu vorbește că tocmai nu modet sunt neri, vei avea de alta sentată, am răzgândit de bujăș că tocmai nu. I think that uh, it is necessary to have training on smoking cessation for health professionals. Uh, as you see, uh, 84% uh, of uh, respondents uh, agreed on this statement, and it's it's it, it's a good sign but also an indication that there, there are no such trainings. And uh, let me uh, very briefly uh, introduce the current, uh, current uh, efforts uh, of our center uh, and School of Public Health at AVA. We are implementing a pilot project uh, in cooperation with uh, Geneva, uh, University of Geneva and Czech colleagues from Brno and uh, the project is um, uh, aiming at uh, testing a Swiss model of uh, training of health professionals, which is based on, on um, stages of change. It's, it, it's uh, actually training uh, of medical residents, <coughs> where we have trained 40 medical residents of the Yerevan State Me uh, Medical University. And uh, the specifics of this training program is that it employs uh, active learning methods like uh, role play, but also standardized patients. Actually, this, um, this method, uh, standardized patients, was implemented in, in Armenia for the first time. We have uh, selected and trained free uh, professional actors, and they were serving as standardized patients during the uh, workshop. So uh, it, it's still um, upon us to evaluate the results and the pro project is ongoing, so uh, I, I will not talk uh, too much about that. We'll have many other opportunities, hopefully. So let me uh, conclude with uh, suggesting, by suggesting some uh, agenda for future research and policy action. Um, in the uh, research area, we, we need uh, desperately to know, uh, do the smoking cessation interventions that proved effect, effective worldwide or somewhere uh, elsewhere work in, Ar in Armenia? Are they culturally sensitive? What uh, do we need to teach and how do we need to teach about treating tobacco dependence? And of course, we need to monitor uh, the trends in smoking rates, both in general population and uh, among health professionals. For the uh, policy part, uh, we of course need to um, sustain uh, demand for, uh, for smoking cessation by implementing, by, by strengthening our actions uh, within the F FCTC framework, but also uh, implement training uh, programs for health professionals, so they would be able professionally and um, adequately uh, help their patients. Another issue is uh, the absence or uh, low accept, uh, um, accessibility of pharmacological treatments. Uh, there was a, a market research within another pro uh, project recently, and we found out that um, 
actually the most uh, accessible and uh, prevalent uh, medication is Citizen, which is a uh, brand name is Tabix. Generic name is Citizen and brand uh, name is Tabix is Bulgarian uh, medication. It's not known, uh, almost not known uh, in the West, but uh, in this part of the world, uh, uh, it has been in place for several decades. And it, it actually, uh, uh, just recently, some studies uh, started to show its effectiveness. So there is a potential in using that. Uh, and uh, nicotine replacement uh, therapies are available partly, but they are not, um, they are quite expensive. They are really expensive, I would say. And of course, uh, if there will be a political will, and we should advocate for that, uh, there is a need to establish mandatory recording of smoking status in all medical records. It, it won't uh, require uh, uh, a lot of resources, it, it should be just advocated and pushed forward. That's all I wanted to say, um, and I, I will be looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, please join us for answering questions. Thank you very much for that presentation. For you, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that as healthcare professionals, we are responsible on those five or six items, and you concentrated on the third item, which was education and support. And I firmly believe that we also, as healthcare professionals, need to change policy. And um, in our experience in California, we had severe taxation of uh, cigarettes, and it completely changed the prevalence of smoking. Has anything like that been done in Armenia? Thank you very much for your question. I couldn't agree more. Actually, um, uh, I and uh, the, the, our center were involved in a policy project since 2004. I directed uh, a number of policy-related uh, uh, programs. And uh, I even more, my, my interest in this topic started when I visited California for the first time in 2002. So I, I discovered a smoke-free world. It was such a, uh, it, it made such a great uh, impression on me. So I, I, I when upon my return, I started looking for, for such a project and I was very lucky. Yes, um, it is very important. We were very active in that. And uh, in 2004, there was, um, we established in our other colleagues, health professional organizations, uh, a public health alliance, which was uh, also the core group for future um, tobacco-free Armenia coalition, public coalition. So we advocated uh, for, for uh, um, policy change, like we have now uh, also partial but ban of smoking in public places. It, it, it's incomplete, it's weak, but we have some, we didn't. And uh, the ban of advertising, the uh, like external ad advertising, street advertising and in electronic media uh, was done in um, also thanks to uh, the work of this coalition. So yes, um, the policy uh, uh, measures are the most cost effective and um, I, I would uh, not be tired any time to repeat that only the complex of measures, policy measures as uh, suggested by FCTC uh, can lead actually to some uh, decrease in smoking rates. Yeah, thank you for the question.
Okay, thank you very much for the feedback and question. Uh, the rate of depression uh, even uh, was more, uh, even was higher in a study conducted by one of our graduates, a published study in elderly homes and uh, households, comparative study between elderly over 65 years old. It was close to 84, 85% according to her estimates. And the difference between uh, ages in terms of depression prevalence remains even when controlling for chronic health conditions, including the other psychopathologies and all the other factors. So uh, it, it is not completely controlled by other factors. Age remains still, uh, for sure, if we control for all possible factors, we will find an explanation of why the age is determinant. But still, uh, we don't have the complete explanation for this fact. It is just very high. And my, uh, my own uh, understanding of this is that probably insecurity unsecure, in the old ages low pensions, uh, dependence from family members for very simple uh, issues is con uh, contributes to this situation. Difficult to see. Thank you to uh, both of the panelists for very interesting um, presentations. I have uh, two questions. The first uh, for Dr. Demirjan. Um, I was taken aback by that slide um, showing the gender disparity uh, among elderly with depression, and I was wondering to what extent um, you or anyone in this field has looked at the role of social exclusion and sort of gender inequality and what, what is leading to that disparity. Uh, my second question for Narine is, um, to what extent um, secondhand smoke has been researched and uh, specifically as it relates to um, public environments and um, healthcare centers and uh, to what extent also policy is, um, there's been uh, sort of um, at a policy level um, some encouraging steps being taken to reduce secondhand smoke exposure. Thank you for the question. Gender disparity uh, for depression is uh, well known. It is uh, the same in, in all the age groups almost and in all countries. Women usually have more higher rates of depression than men. And uh, among the hypotheses explaining this are also endocrine hypotheses that explain this by uh, different levels of estrogens and some uh, which are unique for women. Uh, according to this, although it is naturally to expect that after in older ages the gender disparities should decrease. I haven't uh, conducted literature review to see whether this is the case in other countries. In ours, obviously it is not the case gender disparity even, even increases with the older age. Difficult to say, but very interesting subject to study. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, we did um, several, um, ex one project when we did objectively measure smoke, uh, the levels of uh, secondhand smoke, in particular in university and uh, healthcare setting. And we um, uh, actually used those di data along with others to, to change the um, policy within the institution. So, uh, in, because in spite of having a national law on places, we, we saw that it, it is not being uh, enforced actually, so we, we did measure secondhand smoke uh, pollution and um, provocate change. 
uh, another and uh, in uh, on other occasions we, uh, without any use of uh, instrumentation and um, devices we just monitored uh, you know smoking in public places many times uh, mm, the monitoring uh, activities unfortunately um, uh, we don't have such an activity in last uh, last years because you know you you cannot just measure or you know report uh, pollution or not uh, uh, compliance with the law but you have to make it public and um, you know go for for the implications i mean you should remind the policy makers those who who are responsible for policy enforcement and implementation that there is a problem there so these kind of activities were lacking in the last year yes uh, last question because we're running out of time um, i'm really struck by the very high levels of depression and smoking and um, it, it's kind of reminded me that there's been some recent research that shows um, an association between the two that there may actually be um, some um, a, bio, a biochemical mechanism through which smoking and probably even, probably even more importantly secondhand smoke um, may be strongly associated with depression we have seen this in a study with um, antenatal women in Romania, where we really just started analyzing our data and are uncovering a pretty strong relationship between exposure to secondhand smoke during pregnancy and increased risk for depression. So I'm just wondering if that's something you've considered or um, can include as a variable in future studies. Thank you. Uh, we actually we looked at the association between smoking and depression, but our study population were women, and the rates of smoking among women is really low in Armenia, at least the reported rates. So we couldn't find any association between the two, but uh, it is very interesting to, to conduct such type of study among men, and it could be could produce results. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, we planned to run until 4.30, but it's already over 4.30, and we still have two very interesting presentations on environmental pollution and health issues. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask our speakers to be as short as possible. Ailita Tarsian. Uh, she is a healthcare and social program officer at Fund for Armenian Relief. Uh, but she's going to present the study that she did uh, for her thesis project, for her Master of Public Health project uh, that has been supported by the Center for Health Services Research and Development on reproductive health problems among women of childbearing age in Alaverdi and Arctic City. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, today I'm going to speak about the reproductive health problems among women of childbearing age in Ana Bertin, the Arctic study which was conducted in 2013. The statistics says that every minute in the world, 380 women become pregnant. But it also says that every minute in the world, 110 uh, women experience reproductive problems. Um, according to CDC, among reproductive problems are mentioned uh, miscarriages, infertility, birth defects, stillbirth, induced abortions due to medical indications, early neonatal mortality, and others. So, um, the uh, reasons for uh, development of reproductive problems can be different. Among them are mentioned the genetic disorders, anatomical problems, endocrine disorders, which um, can include uh, diabetes, um, problems with thyroid gland. Um, uh, ovarian problems, uh, lifestyle, like smoking and alcohol use, mm -hmm. also infections, among which can be STIs and not only, um, BMI of women, age, and um, exposure to toxic substances, among which can be mentioned drugs, pesticides, sulfur dioxide, and also heavy metals. Um, 
Speaking a little bit about the toxic substances, I want to mention that arsenic is a um, reproductive toxicant. It has a teratogenic effect which can result in uh, miscarriages, congenital malformations and other problems. Lead uh, can um, reduce fertility, lead to miscarriages, birth defects, stillbirth, cadmium um, can uh, lead to decreased sperm motility and uh, development of pathogenic forms of spermatozoa and um, inhalation of sulfur dioxide can lead to uh, low birth weight, fetal death, preterm birth, miscarriages and stillbirth. Um, here are mentioned the exposure pathways by which people can be exposed to the heavy metals and also sulfur dioxide. Let, um, we can uh, be exposed to lead and arsenic by inhalation, ingestion and dermal contact. Um, to cadmium mainly by ingestion. It is, um, though it is mentioned in uh, literature about inhalation and dermal contact also, but this uh, is quite rare. And um, as sulfur dioxide is a gas, um, we, expo we expose to it by inhalation. So um, we can be exposed to all these mentioned substances uh, in the places where smelting and mining activities are being held. And currently in Armenia, we have 270 inactive mines and 400 active mines. Um, this is the map of uh, Armenia, which shows the mining and smelting activities. Um, a study which was done by Dr. Petrosian in 2001 showed that the um, yard soil samples um, contained, 44% uh, of yard soil samples contained lead levels which were, um, and 77% of exterior those dust samples contained uh, lead levels which were higher than uh, maximum allowable concentration, which is equal to 400 milligrams per kilogram, and arsenic concentrations uh, in uh, 50 to 70% of residential soil. Uh, soil samples exceeded the remediation level, which is equal to 80 milligrams per kilogram. Um, another study showed that um, the Sulfur dioxide in the air was 10.4 times higher um, than the maximum allowable concentration, and the lead concentration in the air was 10 times higher than MAC. Um, risk uh, assessment that was done in 2013 showed that um, in all the soil samples, 100% different soil samples, um, contained um, arsenic which was higher than MAC, and the 21% 21.6% of yard soil samples and 55% of school and kindergarten soil samples uh, contained lead, which was um, higher, again, from the maximum allowable concentration. Uh, cadmium was detected only in only one sample, and again, it was higher than MAC. Um, this is um, a picture of Alaverdi, and here you can see the smelter working. Actually, uh, this is a period when the stack was being moved from a lower uh, position to a higher position and an inter intermediate phase when two stacks were uh, currently uh, working there. You can see the smoke into place. During the night hours, both are working still. Okay. <laughs> so uh, for the study, the comparison town was chosen to be Artik. Um, why, why did we choose this um, city? Because uh, Alaverdi and Artik are quite similar uh, to each other with uh, their uh, population size and um, distribution of population based on age, gender, education level and employment. But, but there is uh, one uh, characteristic which, in which, by which uh, they are quite different. It is uh, that Artik doesn't have any smelting activities in it. And um, actually we looked at the miscarriage rate in two Marzit regions where um, Alaverdi and Artik were situa are situated. And uh, in Nori, where Alaverdi is situated, miscarriage rate is about twice uh, higher than in Chirac, where Arctic is situated. So the objectives of the study were to estimate the prevalence of reproductive health problems and to explore um, the association be between being exposed to uh, byproducts of copper smelter, uh, smelter and reproductive health problems. And the target population of the study was uh, where the uh, women of reproductive age, which is 18 to 49 years old, in Alagarti and Artik, we had two equal samples uh, of 370 women in both cities. Um, the study design was cross-sectional survey, and uh, we the strategy was multi-state cluster sampling. Uh, the survey questionnaire 
um, consisted of 73 questions, um, of four main domains about reproductive health, about um, health aspects in general, about behavioral aspects and uh, sociodemographic uh, characteristics, and was um, composed uh, basing on the Reproductive Health Survey Instrument of U.S. Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. It was pretested prior to the um, study and then used during the study. Um, the first stage of uh, sampling um, included the um, cluster starting points, uh, which were chosen by uh, from the um, <coughs> systematic random sampling from the um, presidential election list. And the second stage was um, completing ten interviews um, around the cluster uh, starting points. Here you can see the map of Alaverdi and the places where you tend into uh, each triangle is um, the place where 10 interviews were done. And um, this is Arctic and David's clusters. The independent variable of the study was uh, living in Alaverdi or Arctic as a proxy measure to be exposed to the heavy metals and sulfur dioxide. And the dependent variable was presence or absence of uh, reproductive health problems. Uh, here you can see how many attempts and what results of that attempt did we have uh, to complete 370 uh, interviews uh, in Arctic and uh, here the same uh, data, here is the same data for Alaverti. Um, the descriptive statistics though that we uh, found out was uh, quite similar for the two um, cities um, except the endocrine disorders which were quite higher in Alaverti. And here you can see the um, percentages of uh, reproductive health problems. Um, we found a statistically significant difference between the towns for abortions due to medical indications, early neonatal mortality, and stillbirths. And after adjusting for confounders, we found out that odds for stillbirth were uh, 234, 38 times higher in Alaverdi than in Arctic, and uh, for induced abortions due to medical indications and early neonatal mortality, where they, the odds were the same, 2.67 uh, times higher in Alaverdi than in Arctic. Actually, the results that we found were quite consistent with the literature that uh, exists, um, besides the information about miscarriages, uh, because the literature says that the miscarriages also should be higher in the smelting towns, uh, but um, uh, we found out that um, there is a um, higher rate of migrant work in Arctic, um, particularly more than 40% of our respondents told that their husbands were working uh, in Russia. And um, the literature also says that uh, migrant work is uh, often uh, associated with having STIs, and uh, that's why we think that uh, the result of STIs could be the miscarriages, which were quite higher in Arctic. So, um, saying all this, I want to conclude that the difference between the odds of um, uh, reproductive health problems can be re related to women's exposure to heavy metals and sulfur dioxide in Alaverti. And I want to say thank you to my advising team, uh, to the Center for Health for uh, services research and development for funding my study and of course to the study participants. Thank you. Thank you. And um, now I will ask Rosanna Rikoria to cover the study on children's blood lead levels in metal mining and smelting communities in Armenia. She has been leading our project in mining communities as research associate and project coordinator in the research center of the School of Public Health. Yes, Hargeli 
մինչև մեր հետազոցյան արդյունքներին անրադարնալու մի քանի փաստ է, այսպես լսվում է, ուրեմ են կապար է հանիսանում է ծանր մետաղ, որովոր ունի առողջության վրա կոնքրետ աստեցություններ, հողի և խոշու հետ և այն ու հետև առանց լվացվելու հաճախակի ձերքեր է տանում են բերանը և մեծ կանակով մեջ չապապաժնով կապար են ուր տալիս։ Երկրորդը երեխաների իստամոգ սաղիքային տրակտում կապարը ի համեմատ Եվ ի վերջո երեխաների մոտ ուղեղի պատնեշային համակարգը, այսինքն հեմատորեն ծեպալի բարյարը, որը պաշպանում է ուղեղը թունավոր նյութերից և ծանր մետաղնից, թույս զարգացած է դարևը սվաղ շրջանում պատասխանը, որ ոչ չկա, հետազոտությունները ծուց են տալիս, որ անգամ ամենաչին չին կանակները կապված են, ասուցացված են որոշակի առողջական էվեկների հետ։ Եվ երկրորդը հարց է առաջանում ինչ կանակի հետ պետք է համ որը հինք միկրոգրամ դեցի լիտր է մեկից հինք տարեկան երեխաների արյան մեջ կապարի համար։ Ինչ է նշանակում այս ռեվերենսային մակարդակը։ Այնցուց է տալիս, որ ամերիկայի միացալ նահանգներում հետազոտված ունեցել է կապար արյան մեջ, ավելի քիչ կան հինք միկրոգրամ դեցի լիտրը։ Սա պազապես իշենք հետո մեր հետազոտության արդունքների հետ համմատություն կանենք։ Ուրեմ են կանի որ մեր հետազոտություն նայում էր իսկի � դրսում անձկացվող շամանակը, ուտելուց առայր ձերքերը չլվանալ ու սովորությունը, հիմնական խնամակալի ծած էր գրծության ասպիճանը, ընտանիքի սոցյալ պնտեսական ծան էր պիճակը, ուրեմ են աղտոտիչի մոտ գտնվել դրսում հողի ու փոշում մեջ կապարի հետ, ուրեմ են ծնողի հանքում կամ որև է պղնձածուլական արդյունաբերություն աշխատելու պակտը, պաստը։ Եվ ի վերջո պասիվ ծխել է։ Հիմա մի փոքր Հայաստանի իրավիճակը աղպյուրները, կապարի ավտոգման գխավոր աղպյուրները հանիսանում են հանքրարդյունաբերությունը և պղնձածուլական գործունայությունը։ Հայաստանում ուրեմ են մենք ունենք 670 հանքեր, որոնցից 22-ը ակտիվ մետաղական հանքեր որը մենք երեկ համայնք ենք ընտրել հետազոտության համար ալավերդին, որտեղ ունենք բղնձի ձուլարան, աղթալան, որտեղ ունենք վերամուշակման գործարան և բած բարիտային բազմամետաղային հանք, ինչպես նաև ենտեղ ուն կապարի կանակի որոշուն էր մեկից հինք չորսից վեծ տարեկան երեխաների արյան մեջ, բացի դրանից անկան մենք տեսնել լիսկի գործոնները ընդհանուր ընտրանքի համար, ինչպես նաև առանձին երեկ համայնքների համար, որոնք որ բերում 
ամեն որ չմաքրելու դեպքում 35 տոկոսով կապարի քանակը ավելի բարձ է քան այն ընտանիքների երեխաների մոտ որոնց որոնց դեպքում ամեն օրեն փոշի մաքրում սա նշանակում է որ աղտոտումը փոշուց է ինչ որ արմոտ տեղի ունենում եւ եթե օրինակ կրթական ծրագրեր լինեն որոնք որ տան անդամներին կխրախուս են որ ամեն օր տան փոշիները մաքրեն փաստուրին 35 տոկոսով կարելի որոշ չափով կարելի կրճատել կապարի քանակը երեխաների այլան մեջ որն ալավերդյում միակ փոփոխականը որը կապ է ունեցել մեր երեխաների այլան մեջ կապարի քանակի հետ դա հերավորությունն է ավտոտիչից ուրեմն մոտիկ տարածքներում ապրողների մոտ 19%-ով փաստորեն ավելի բարձր է հենց զուլարանի մոտ տարածքում 19%-ով կապարի քանակ ավելի բարձր է քան հերոտ հավամասերում ապրող երեխաների մոտ եւ մի հետաքրքիր փոխազդեցություն փոփոխականների միջև հայտնաբերեցինք Երևանում որը Երևան դարձած ծնողների կրթության մակարդակը նշանակություն ունի բայց ավելի հետաքրքիր է հետեւյալ փոխազդեցությունը ուրեմն երբ որ մենք նայել ենք պատուհանների ազդեցությունը երեխաների վրա երեխաների մոտ արյան արյան մեջ կապարի քանակության վրա եւ բաժանել ենք այդ ազդեցությունը ըստ երկու գոտիների մոտիկ տարածքներում ապրող երեխաներ եւ հերոտ տարածքներում ապրող երեխաներ ապա տեսել ենք որ մոտիկ տարածքում պատուհանը նշանակություն չունի կապ չունի թե դու տան մեջ ինչ պատուհաններ ունես նոր վակում այն պատուհաններ են թե հին պատուհաններ են միևնույն է քանակը նույնն է բայց երբ որ նայել ենք հերոտ տարածության վրա հայտնաբերել ենք որ ուրեմն հին պատուհանները չէ փոխված պատուհանները սովետական շրջանից մնացած հին պատուհանները ի համեմատ նոր այդպես կոչված եվրոպատուհանների 101%-ով բարձրացնում են կապարի քանակության միջին այսինքն մոտ երկու անգամ ինչ է իր գործնական նշանակությունն է այսինքն հերոտ տարածքներում Երևանում եթե պատուհանները փոխվեն ապա հնարավոր է կրճատել կապարի քանակությունը Եվ արակ ասեմ ինչ եզրակացություններ կարելի է անել մեր արդյունքներից փաստորեն արդեն նշեցի որ երեխաների մոտ ռեֆերենսային մակարդակը գերազանցող տոկոսը երեխաների տոկոսը շատ բարձր է մեզ մոտ 69 տոկոս ի համար ամերիկայի միացյալ նահանգներ երկուսու կես տոկոսի որն առավել ավտոպած համայնք է ավթալան դրան հետև մեն ալավերդին այնու հետև Երևանը ուրեմն երեխաների մեջ արյան երեխաների մոտ արյան մեջ կապարի քանակության ավտոտումը կապ ունի հողի մեջ այսինքն այդ դինամիկան շատ նման է հողում ծան հողում կապարի քանակի մինչ այս արված հետազոտությունները ցույց են տվել որ ավթալայում հողում կապարի քանակը գերազանցել է թույլատրել են 27 տոկոս նմուշներում իսկ ալավերդյում ընդհանրը 24 տոկոս նմուշներում իսկ Երևանում չի հայտնաբերվել կապար այսինքն այստեղ ցույցատալիս կապը հողի եւ փոշու միջոցով հնարավոր ավտոտման հիմա հաջորդը մեր հետազոտություն հնարավորություն է տալիս ըստ համայնքների իրականացնել գործողություններ այսինքն մի քաղաքական ցան փոփոխություն կամ իրավական փոփոխություններ եւ հատկապես ուշադրություն դարձնել ավթալայում կահույքի փոշու սովորությանը այսինքն դա գործնական նշանակություն կարող է ունենալ եթե ընտանիքի անդամների շրջանում կրթական ինչ որ ծրագրեր արվեն եւ Երևանում գործնական նշանակություն ունի այդ պատուհանների հարցը առավել հեռու հեռու տարածքներում Երևի ես քանը փորձի հնարավորինս կարճ եթե հարցերն եք հնդրեմ Շնորհակալություն Thank you So uh, Ruzana's presentation was in Armenian but her slides were in English so hopefully our English speaking audience got the content In terms of answering the questions for this session, we will try to say it in two languages because our translation was scheduled until 4:30 unfortunately. Շատ նրականություն, շատ տխուր եւ հետաքրքիր ներկայացման համար մի հարց, եթե Երևանի հողի նմուշներում կապար չի հայտնաբերվել, բայց Երևան մեր 50 տոկոսից ավելի երեխաների է ունի այդ ռեֆերենս մակարդակից ավելի բարձր տոկոս կապարի ուրեմն ախտոտման աղբյուրները Երևանում այլ են եւ Երևի բավականին լուրջ աղբյուրներ կան որ այդպիսի տոկոսների ենք հասել I will briefly translate the question uh, because in Yerevan you mentioned that you didn't find lead in the soil however about 50% of children had higher than 5 microgram per deciliter probably the source is different so what could you say about it Ուրեմն այդ հողի մեջ կապարի քանակի հետազոտությունները 
Հողի մեջ հետազոտության կապարի կանակի հետազոտության տվյալները որ բերեցի, աղթալայի և ալավերդի դեպքում դրանք խորացված համապարպակ հետազոտության արդյունքներ են, որոնք որ երկու հարյուրից ավելի հողի նմուշների հետազոտության արդյունքներ են, այսինքն ավելի վստահելի են։ Այն ինչ երևանի հետազոտության արդյունքներ են, միայն մի քանի հողերի արակ հետազոտման արդյունքներ են, նմուշների թիվը չի գերազանցել ասը։ Այսքը երևանի դեպքում պնդել, որ հողում չկա կապար, մեր կողմից մի կչից խարկը լինի, ավելի շուտ կարող ենք ասել, որ առակ հետազոտ մաժամնեք չենք հայտնաբերել կապար։ Բայց ամեն դեպքում երևանում երբ կապարի կանակը որոշում են գերեխաների այրան մեջ, մի դեպ պատահեց, որտեղ կարծամ հիսունը գերազանցել էր երեխայի այրան մեջ կապարի կանակը և տվյալ դեպքը հատուկ լրածուցի չ որից որ կատում է կապար և այդ երեխային հետազոտությունց ընդհանուր հանեցինք, որպես ոչ ներկացուչական դեպք, բայց շահնակեցինք ընտանիքի հետ աշխատել, գրթական նյութեր տրամադրեցինք մի քանի անգամ հանդիպեցին I'll summarize the answer. So in Yerevan, we only have done rapid risk assessment with only 10 samples. So we cannot claim that soil in Yerevan is clean. While in Alaverdi and Aftala, we have had a very thorough risk assessment. We have had a couple of hundred samples collected from the whole community. That's one thing. And in Yerevan, we discovered one case when the child's BLL was much higher than 50, which is like, it, that the child has to be hospitalized. But that one was related to his father's car mechanic shop and he was doing lead smelting in his garage. So more assessments needs to be done in Yerevan. I'd like to thank um, the American University of Armenia for a fantastic satellite symposium. So proud of all of the work that you're doing and particularly impressed by the uh, quality of the thesis projects that have been presented today. Uh, I have a quick question for Rosanna. How is dusting the furniture defined? Because I don't really understand taking dust off, and I don't understand whether they're using a vacuum for that or a um, broom. 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 Broom մակրում եք թե չէ, թատ շորով մակրում եք թե չէ, չոր ավելով մակրում եք թե չէ, կոնքրետ կահույքի հարց եսպես է հնչել, դուք շորով կահույքի փոշին մակրում եք թե ոչ, և ենտեղ պատասխանների տարբերակներ կար, որ ընտրվում էին, � Այս դեպքում ստացվեց, որ ամեն որ մակրել է ինքը պաշպանիչ ազդեցություն ունի կապարի կանակի վրա համեմատած ամեն որ չմակրել ում։ Այսք շորով մակերեսները։ Իրականում շատ տարբեր հարցեր չենք ունեցել հենց կահույքի փոշին մակրել ու հետ կապած։ Կահույքի փոշու վերաբերալ եղել է միայն մեկ հարց, իսկ մյուս մակրության վերաբերալ հարցերը դրանք վիճակադրորեն հավաստի կապի մեջ չեն մեր վերջնական փոխոխականի հետ։ Միայն այդ կահույքի փոշու հարցներ, որ ծուստվեց, որ կա վիճակագրորեն հավաստի And this was the only variable that had statistically significant association with the outcome variable. Yes. Do you have any idea how much the cost? Uh huh. Do you have any idea how much cost to industry would take to clean to install some kind of clean? I mean, is it just a question of clean filters, or do they have to completely rework the? the factories is if it you know do you have any idea what the cost to industry would be because that would make a big difference in terms of getting a buy-in 
Uh, I will answer this general question. No, we have no clue what it would cost to the industry to do modernizing because that factory, uh, the smelter factory, is very, very old. However, we know the industry's answer, which sounds like an ultimatum to their population. This has been reported in the media. The director of the factory says, I mean, if it comes to the question whether we should close down the, the smelter, or modernize it, we know the answer, it's closing down the factory, which would be disastrous for that community because they are so much dependent on that industry. And when we were doing the studies, they were scared that we are going to close down the smelter, for example. They were scared even to participate in our project, thinking that their husband or you know their relative may lose the job with the industry. So it's a huge issue. Last question. Yeah. Uh, my question is to Dr. Sar Sarkitsya. Uh, you were uh, speaking uh, about the magnitude of the problem on the uh, reproductive uh, health uh, among the uh, women in childbearing age. Uh, uh, what, uh, what are the strategies can be handled uh, to uh, reduce this uh, health problem in this community? Because uh, you have shown odds ratio of more than uh, two in uh, all uh, the uh, yeah, variables. In that, uh, what are the strategies can be? Because uh, my question is that, uh, as Dr. Petrosian right now said, the community is uh, very much dependent on this melter and also mining. And moreover, the country is also dependent on the uh, uh, mining companies because uh, it is the highest tax yielding uh, among any other sector. Let me comment on your last comment. That's not very true. The country is not dependent on mining industry. It's exaggerated information, but I will ask Ayurveda to answer. Um, first of all, I think uh, we should uh, check the blood that levels in order among women in order to be sure that um, the results, um, so the, the reproductive health problems are because of the lead levels and heavy metals in blood, because here we are, uh, we have measured only the association. And um, later, um, oh, <laughs> I don't know, actually, maybe. I think the only solution is modernization mm -hmm. of that factory and also some remediation in the community. However, these are things that are out of our control. We can help the community to raise the issue but for example, if you try to find funding agencies to help the community, they refuse because it's a, this is an active industry and everyone thinks that it's industry's responsibility to address the issue. That Therefore, you will not be able to find any money to help the community in terms of remediation or modernizing the, the industry. It's up to the industry, it's up to the community to, to raise the issue. It's up to the governmental agencies responsible for this issue to enforce our regulations, to strengthen the regulations and make the industry more responsible. But because we are already abusing your patience, sorry, we, it took us 45 minutes longer than planned, actually 35 minutes because we started 10 minutes later. Uh, sorry for that. Thank you very much for being. Thank you very much to our all our presenters and thank you for staying with us.